There we go. Okay, I can see you now. Screen was black for some reason. <clears throat> I apologize, my voice is a little bit husky today. I am still recovering from whatever the hell I had, but I'm feeling much better, so that's good. So... What are we doing today? Um, Second Thought released a video called Why Hearing Both Sides is Dangerous, which I'll put on the screen now. To which uh, Short Fatter Taco replied, Why Hearing Both Sides is good, actually. And for some reason, it's. What is this? Oh, it's got a weird timeline view. There we go. Shh. Not yet. Um, and it's, uh, it's a terrible reply. It's one of the most incoherent, uninformed, presumptuous things I've ever seen. Um, and he has the audacity. The unmitigated gall. To, uh, try to bring Carl Schmidt to bear in some way. Um, so this is going to be a butchery. Happy New Year to you too, Plectronus Sorcerer. So do you see here? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's today. Um, <clears throat> this may take a little while. The first video was 14 minutes and 35 seconds. The second one is 25. Plus our analysis, I reckon we're going to be here for at least an hour and a half on this. Maybe more. So we'll see. This is live. In fact, I'm alive. Rumors of my untimely demise have been grossly exaggerated. Well, without further ado, I should probably take notes. By the way, how's my lighting? Um, I actually have a ring light now, so I won't just be a beige blur in the background. The overhead lights are off. It's just a blinding sphinx-like eye of a ring light over my screen. I don't know how on earth people work with these for this long, but we're going to try. All right, let's get into it. This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. In some other news, I recently started a podcast with Hakeem and Ugopnik. It's called The D Program, and it's a show dedicated to helping listeners shake off the capitalist programming we've all been subjected to over the years. We tackle all sorts of topics, from theory to current events to culture, and just generally have a good time. If that sounds like something you'd enjoy... Let me know if the audio balancing is good, guys. Enjoy? Be sure to check it out by following any of the links below. The truth isn't always in the middle. Sometimes, you have to pick a side. This week, we're talking about having left-wing political beliefs. Now, this might sound like we're running out of topics. Let's begin. Oftentimes, it can feel like having a strong, ideological, and staunchly left-wing political opinion is seen as an inherently bad thing especially according to liberal politicians. Biden, for example, can almost always be found muttering about healing the nation, reaching across the aisle, 
combating polarization, or not ceding to the extremes. Extremes there with an S at the end. If Democrats lost the latest election, it is always because they didn't listen or talk to the undecided voters in the center enough. And if they won, well, now it's time to reach across the aisle and do politics the right way by hearing the other side out. Now, he's probably going to go into this uh, in the video itself, but just as a quick commentary on this, this is um, emblemizing one of the uh, key, not necessarily flaws, but one of the key features of liberal political thinking. Um, and again, Carl Schmidt's going to feature into this later, so I'll just, I'll, I'll paraphrase him. Um, the political fundamentally concerns conflict between discrete entities, right? So the word political itself comes from the word uh, polis, obviously, which itself originally referred to a wall. Not a city, but a wall. So the Acropolis, the center of Athens, the Acropolis, that's a wall or a fortress on a mountain, right? Um, liberalism is entirely internally oriented. So it is, it is not concerned with conflict between discrete entities. It treats institutions as filters that do away with the need for politics, with the need for like the agonistic struggle between discrete entities. So it's not a neutral position. It is firmly on side of established institutions. Um, but vis-a-vis uh, -vis left and right, um, its only solution is to refer them to um, institutions like rules in a game. Um, and indeed, uh, liberal politics does uh, treat politics essentially like a game. You start with uh, neutral rules that are even on all sides, and you, you find uh, disparity and inequality as the result. So sort of like a game of soccer. Both sides have, abide by the same rules. Inequality is the result of the game playing out according to those rules. That's a terrible way to do politics because the entire point is that we organize willfully um, and deliberately so that we get the outcomes that we want. Not we set up rules and then refer everything to, to the, the whims of chance. Um, now, of, of course, that's not actually what liberals do in practice. Um, liberals are very much partisans of existing systems, and so when those systems themselves are threatened, they then allow themselves to then play the game as, as cruelly and viciously as everybody else does. But until such a point as that, it's an intrinsically hegemonic stance that will not acknowledge the need for actual political engagement until the moment of crisis. The way to go is always to push a little more towards the right and be a little more amenable to conservative discourse. Endless twists on these same serious shut up. <laughs> slogans have been presented to us by liberal politicians for years, with the barely hidden assumption that it's simply the more grown up, reasonable thing to do to have this kind of pragmatic approach to politics, to seek compromise above ideological commitment, to play the game of democracy, quote, the right way. Having opinions that are irreconcilable with the opposition is just being childish. The mature thing to do is sit down and talk and figure out a way to coexist, no matter what the other side says. And this makes sense when you understand how liberals think of politics in general. Liberals tend to understand politics as the debate of ideas. The motor of the political history car, for liberal thinkers and politicians, has long been idealism. Successive debates on the nature of what is good and just. Whereas Marxists view okay. the movie- It's not what idealism means. He's correct though. Again, the treatment of, uh, uh, the way liberals treat politics is it's institutions are a filter. Good things pass through the filter and come out the other side. Bad things don't. And there's a dogmatic faith in that system that bears no scrutiny whatsoever. It's, it's a silly idea movement of politics through the lens of power distribution and materialism, liberals tend to believe that it is through reason and argumentation that ideas appear and enter into political conflict, and those that are right triumph, and those that are wrong fail to shape the world. The good always wins over the bad, and reason always comes out on top, if only in the long run. It can't go any other way because what determines what is good is the outcome of debate. Politics is therefore about who has the better arguments. And in our neoliberal society, so heavily steeped in business juice, this is sometimes referred to as the marketplace of ideas thesis. 
it's a now, crucially this marketplace of ideas thesis um this is not an institution this is just a set this is just a, a conceit it's just a conceit um the state apparatus is essentially identical between a fascist government and a liberal government the only difference is the attitude towards institutions are the institutions things that you manipulate to procure the outcome that you want or are the institutions things that you allow to sort of blindly filter um sort of things as they historically appear so in uh well let's let's take the case of let's take the case of uh the uh the right wingers um at the uh tail end of the weimar republic um the reichstag essentially fell into uh irrelevancy not because the institution itself was cancelled out but because people in government and people in parliament did not treat it as if it mattered you had communists and nazis the center was basically dissolved and you had the uh president and the chancellor all wanting the dissolution of the democracy and to switch to some other type of um of of state form or, or government form um and the the institutions did not actually thereby shift the institutions were functionally the same However, their efficacy as liberal institutions depended on a particular attitude being observed. And so once uh, the Nazis came into power, um, which was still with a, a largely conservative, not Nazi uh, government, which thought they could control him, um, those institutions proved no hindrance whatsoever. In fact, they were highly useful. Because in the attempt to uh, stamp out enemies of the established um, government, as well as enemies prior, when the Sock Dems were in power, enemies of the uh, of the liberal institutions themselves, um, all the things that could have under a robust liberal system actually worked against uh, Hitler, they were essentially treated as negligible. Um, because as it turns out, the uh, institutions don't actually filter ideas. Ideas filter the institutions. Bit of a generalization, but for liberals, this is what politics is at its core. The debate of ideas. And it's a really attractive concept. But it doesn't always work like they expect it to. Like right now, for example. Bad ideas have been winning recently. Fascist, nationalist, and identitarian politics have been on the rise for years at this point throughout the liberal world. And it's not just ideas. Hate crimes, too. Femicides, the killing of members of the LGBT community, anti-Semitism, the murder of black and Asian Americans, all of them are trending upwards. Bad ideas are- These are distinct. Um, the rise of uh, violent action can't be directly attributable to the uh, filtering process of institutions failing. Um, however, it does work to his favor that the consistent ability of um, fascists and other toxic uh, individuals to uh, obtain a megaphone just by essentially buying it out um, is is dangerous. In, in in a sense, like his his thesis is unimpeachable, no matter what his statement is at the end, because of course, hearing both sides is dangerous. Just hearing only one side is dangerous. Politics is dangerous. It's concerned with war at bottom. If you're a liberal, it's concerned with the uh, evasion of war by means of uh, institutions as as kind of a a conflict venting game. Um, if you're if you're not a liberal, well, I mean, it gets, gets a whole lot more simple. Now you're just playing. Uh, now you're just doing war by other means. Are gaining political ground in the marketplace, and the results aren't good, and there's a reason for that. It's, it's not that libs think ideas shape the world, but that we should make a system where that is the case. Uh, well, here's here's the problem, though. Um, no, no, libs don't think ideas should shape the world. They think ideas should shape policy, given a liberal system prevailing in the world. And those are two distinct things. Because you're not allowing that same process to dictate whether or not it's a liberal system in place. It's not that suddenly fascist arguments were reworded in the perfect way, slipping into the unsuspecting minds of millions of conservatives in a feat of rhetorical trickery. Neither is it the case that conservatives are just dumb. 
No, it's because politics isn't all about ideas. True, but some of them are just dumb, let's be honest. In other words, ideas and their success are not just a matter of argumentation. They are heavily conditioned by material circumstances. Oh, okay. It's our current socio-political and economic context that gives fascist rhetoric a foothold and the means to be developed. Okay. Let me be more specific. What the neoliberal era has produced, which is to say massive inequality, okay. the death of the welfare state compromise, and perpetual war, has been seized upon by fascist rhetoric. Where socialists can explain this general worsening of conditions. Okay, a little sloppy, but I'll allow it. Um, when we're talking about material conditions, what we're really talking about are the, like, really at its core, what we're talking about are the, the, the types and modes of production around which the society and its structure is oriented. It's essentially that. Um, we're not talking about, like, oh, there's inequality. There's always inequality. We're not talking about, like, events, right? Conditions for all but an extremely wealthy minority through an analysis of systems and institutions, fascists hijack these explanations and transform them by blaming what's wrong with the world not on systems, but on the existence of the wrong kind of people, thereby protecting existing institutions. And it works. The best predictor of whether someone voted for Trump in 2016 was racial resentment. And that's at least partly because plenty of people are happy to make sure it stays that way. The reason that Tucker Carlson has the most watched show in America and there are no leftists on major television networks isn't because he has the best ideas, but because he has the ideas that Fox's billionaire owner is willing to pay for. No billionaire wants to fund an anti-capitalist pundit, but plenty are willing to pay for the guy who will say that white people are being replaced when viewers ask what's wrong with this country. And this- I mean, that's not entirely true. There are anti-capitalist billionaires. Um, well, eh, 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 no, no, I'm going to take that back. No, there aren't anti-capitalist billionaires. There are billionaires who pay, uh, the opposite <laughs> rhetoricians from Tucker, which, which are not radical, uh, which on, on this plane are not actual radical leftists. Yeah, scratch that. This is frustrating because what do liberals do about this state of affairs? Well, first, they usually refuse to recognize that a system of- Sorry, this this is the problem with um, binary thinking because you tend to uh, ascribe qualities opposite the thing that you're you're describing as as like its true opposite. Um, when you're when you're thinking of like the opposite of of Tucker or the opposite of the Republicans, you can be thinking about like the opposite of the right, which is the left, or you can be thinking of the opposite party in a two-party system. In which case, yes, there are billionaires who fund them, but that is not the same as being leftist. Private ownership of media institutions creates these consequences. They refuse hey, to- Hey, I walked that back, you shut up. Knowledge that capitalist-owned media obviously promotes pro-capitalist politics, and in times of acute trouble, has a tendency to scapegoat capitalism's problems by blaming them on black people, Asian people, immigrants, <laughs> trans people, Jewish people, or really anyone whose identity is immutable yeah. and easy to victimize. Liberals don't like talking about media ownership like this. At least not so directly or in such terms. Because acknowledging it would mean admitting that having the best argument isn't always enough. Liberals prefer to believe that the political system is value neutral, and that any idea, like any business, can thrive in the marketplace on merit alone. But once again, like in business, that's simply not true. The socio-political- Now here's, here's the- here's where he's gonna run into trouble with, I think, short fatter talker. I can't remember if he goes into this at all. But one of the problems with um, with dogmatic liberals who aren't critical about this, because you can prefer a liberal system, right? There isn't a contradiction there. Um, a, a lot of the, the norms by which uh, left-wing ethics are governed are liberal in their origin. Um, however, if you're a dogmatic liberal and you insist in advance of actually scrutinizing it, that uh, a liberal attitude simply solves all the problems, then you're going to retroactively characterize the state of affairs currently, given the liberal system, as being uh, simply those things which have been accurately determined by the system to be the best. And so it becomes a merit of an idea that it has become, that it has become well-funded enough to actually gain prevalence. So there's a lot of circular reasoning here. Capitalist system is not neutral to the arguments that inhabit it. 
Some arguments will win not on their merit, but on their ability to conform with the system and its actors. In practice, some ideas won't get broadcast very much or will get outright censored, some will be able to roam freely, and some will get a boost. It's just not enough to simply send ideas out there, mainly because there are better funded ideas out there waiting in the shadows to beat the shit out of them. And it probably doesn't help that at the end of the day, Democrats need money too. To get election funding, you need billionaires just like the conservatives do. That is a nice cardigan though, isn't it? I'm too broad for that kind of thing. That would look like, uh, you know? Rejecting capitalism makes it really hard to get on TV stations owned by capitalists on favorable terms, harder to advertise yourself, and therefore harder to win. So what do Democrats do instead if they can't or are unwilling to criticize the conditions in which ideological debate happens? What do they do since they assume that the conditions are mostly fair for- To make a deal with Satan like Nancy Pelosi so they never age for 20 years. For everyone because there's no one actively censoring the public debate. Well, they'll blame the extremes for getting things out of whack, find comfort in the idea that given due time, things will eventually resolve when the arc of history bends towards justice, and double down by insisting that we must hear both sides. Liberals cling to the idea that even though this process of idealistic debate, whether in privately owned media or in government, was not meant to work for the realization of justice, but to preserve the hierarchical order that benefited its founders, that it is still immoral to work outside of it, and equally so from the left or the right. Liberals are desperate for a political process that can work in all circumstances that can be perfectly neutral in the way it gives space for divergent ideas and can totally abstract the stark power imbalances of the real world through reason alone. Okay, he's not wrong. He could have simplified this though. He could have just said liberals are desperate for a political process. Um, one of the things that decisionistic uh, theorists uh, following from Schmidt, and really like in essence going back before Schmidt, actually to the, interestingly enough to the origins of the liberal tradition, will emphasize um, is that at bottom, um, sovereignty is defined by, uh, an entity that has a choice, that has a decision. They make an arbitrary judgment and a decision on what will be done for the future or to secure like a specific type of future. Um, liberals want to refer, uh, the decision to a process. So no individual has to uh, bear the embarrassment of saying that I chose this. Um, instead, it's just it's just how the cookie crumbles. We had a grid, stuff went through the grid, and we're just going to assume the good stuff came out the bottom and the bad stuff was left in. Um, that's that's fundamentally it. When you have uh, like think about think about like every every um, well we're all in liberal states today, with some some exceptions. Um, Think about uh, your government class. What what was it concerned with? Was it concerned with ultimately who gets to make decisions? Or was it hyper-concerned with the processes that make sure that no one person gets to make decisions? And there's merits to this, right? Because like people in in uh, decision-making, um, in, in positions of, of ultimate decision-making authority, they've done really terrible things to their own people and to other people. Um, here's the catch. So have processes. It was blind processes that brought uh, the Nazis into power. It's blind processes that um, result in a politics of indifference, where you have huge numbers of people just left to squalor. Um, why? Because the, the process was treated as God. The word you're looking for is save, calling it a grid is absurdly abstract. Well, I mean, a grid can, can sieve things out, right? You know? It's just... It's... But it can't. And simultaneously, they refuse to challenge the capitalist economic system that builds those very same power imbalances into reality. What we're left with is a call to hear both sides in a world that will heavily cater to one side the side that is prepared to dispose of everyone outside an ever-shrinking in-group before admitting that there might be something wrong with our current economic model. In more concrete terms, it looks like this. 
Every year between 2003 and 2010, climate change denial organizations had an income over $900 million. $900 million that they could spend on spreading disinformation. Almost a billion dollars to set the terms of what one of the two sides would be. On TV, it meant having a climate change denier pitted against a climate scientist, with the implication that the two sides of the debate were equally worthy of consideration. And so what's the solution? Why the fuck do you think I know what the solution is? This is like a, 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 a problem at the scale of the entire world system of states. Maybe larger than that. I don't have a solution, are you kidding? And that the audience could make up their minds between two mostly evenly matched arguments. When there is a dogmatic commitment to hear both sides, but no analytical model to understand how both sides form, this is what you get. A model of public debate where one side can pay to set the terms of the conversation, and in the process, artificially delay a public decision in their favor. Fossil fuel companies paid for the debate to be between climate change's existence and climate change being a farce. And it won them enough time to shift the debate to where good. it is today, this is a good point, where actually. climate change is now broadly acknowledged, but now we debate how quickly we really want- I actually touch on this in my Truth and State video. This is, uh, this is a very good point. To adapt, once again, buying them more time. Time itself is a tool in a bad faith debater's hand. So long as we continue debating on these terms and delay the moment where we commit to a decision, the current state of affairs continues uninterrupted. But we don't have to treat ideas like these, ideas that are more compatible with the capitalist system, as equal to ideas that are more compatible with our values of justice. We know that putting a climate denier on equal footing with a climate scientist on TV is not objectivity. The two positions are not equivalent. One is obviously wrong, and it is okay, in fact it is the moral imperative, to treat these two positions with imbalance. Now the problem is, and this is where he's going to get into a lot of trouble with his critics, although it was smart from like a, an exposure point of view. Um, he titled this video, Why Hearing Both Sides is Dangerous. However, naturally in the course of making this video, he had to hear both sides. What he's talking about is not hearing both sides. What he's talking about is why preaching the controversy is dangerous. Because the controversy is always going to be only between those two representatives that have managed to secure enough financial backing to make their voices heard when they are excluded. So when we hear about uh, conservatives being uh, excluded from university talks, oh no, Ben Shapiro or Miley Yiannopoulos, they weren't allowed on a college campus. What we don't hear about are all of the professors, staff, adjuncts, etc., etc., who were actually removed from their positions because they criticized something that some university donor took issue with. Um, or or, or uh, they criticized something that some university donor was attached to. Um, we have a few examples of this. Uh, in the uh, lead up to the um, uh, research for the Destiny debate on progressive orthodoxy and, and universities squeezing out conservatives or, or dissident thinkers, um, first of all, we determined that all of the examples of, of conservatives being squeezed out were bullshit. But secondly, um, we found multiple cases um, clear-cut cases of professors actually being removed from positions of, of, uh, of, of teaching because they criticized uh, the, the economic interests of oil companies, politicians, etc. So these did not have the kind of financial backing to get a whole bunch of ordinary um, blokes riled up about it who otherwise wouldn't give... Uh, who, who just wouldn't care what took place inside of a, a university lecture hall at all. Um, so it, it's, it's not even necessarily, it's not even just the case that um, just having a public debate is not by itself sufficient to filter out um, bad ideas and to allow the good ideas to prevail. Um, the sample of people who were actually counted as representing the alternatives uh those may all suck because the buy-in to actually get to that point where you're even being considered for the stage is too high for the people who actually hold the good ideas. Remember the guy who was disciplined after he criticized the governor's Medicaid plan in a public comment since the governor was a donor to the university? Yes, I do, serious. I think it might have actually been you who sent me the link to that one. Then we know about things like the paradox of intolerance. 
A society that tolerates intolerance runs the risk of, should the circumstances prove favorable, losing out to intolerance. It is okay to be committed to tolerance and, in an effort to protect it, therefore to limit the spread of intolerant ideas. So, while it is important to listen to different perspectives, there is nothing wrong with determining one of them to be more correct or more valid than the other. That's the ultimate goal of reflection and scientific inquiry. Having convictions doesn't make you an extremist. It doesn't make you unreasonable or not pragmatic. It makes you a human being who's willing to stand up for what you believe is right rather than let bad ideas have free reign. Or how about this? It also makes you an extremist. And, uh, who the fuck's gonna tell you that that's not okay? The, the liberal governments that uh, ex subsist on hordes of people um, who are basically just neglected despite the ideological presumptions of a liberal system being to benefit the individual and to rule by their consent alone, which exist on categorically stolen land and profit from the residue, uh, not even necessarily the residue, the ongoing uh, colonial exploitation of other places. They're going to tell you you're extreme? Fuck them. There are times when two people can disagree and both have valid points. But there are also times when one narrative should be dismissed outright. Not every idea is a good one. Do your research, adjust your perspectives based on new evidence, and don't be afraid to pick a side. Sometimes oh yeah, that's true, Sirius. Not to mention all the professors disciplined for union activity. Yeah. Well, actually, do send those to me, Sirius, at some point, because we're going we're gonna to go over those soon. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. I'll end on an MLK quote from his letter from Birmingham Jail, because, let's be honest, it's easy points. See you next week. First, I must, must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you and the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises a Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Okay, tangentially related, right? The referral to a process and a stigmatization of taking a hard stance that challenges existing institutions. That's where this is going. It's it's a it's weird how he situated this at the end with little contextualization, but like the the reference kind of kind of works. All right, let's listen to short fat. This is going to suck. This is going to really suck. Also, I can't believe um, Martin Luther King would just use the N-word like that. Unbelievable. Hello, friends. I just finished recording another video. Context for that speech, he is discussing segregation, not socialism. No, he's, he's not discussing um, segregation specifically. What he's talking about is um, the sort of hand-wringing about uh, taking extreme measures or intense measures to deal with things like segregation and racism um, by people who don't have, as it were, skin in the game. Um, and, and the insistence from them that they just need to, uh, they need to allow slower, more humane processes, humane, quote unquote, um, comfortable is, is a more accurate term, uh, to uh, resolve current inequalities and disparities and injustices, uh, which is silly. So when he's talking about setting the timetable, what he's talking about is referring the, uh, uh, white people setting the, uh, timetable for black people securing their freedom and equality. He's talking about the, the dogmatic insistence on referring everything to a slow, impartial process.
know that uh, there's no way it's coming out today. This is going to be a huge project. But hey, if you liked the three... Was fascism actually capitalist? Yes. Yes, it was. Idiot. It, it's not... Okay. Quick aside. Something doesn't cease to be capitalist because there is some kind of ideological content that villainizes capitalism. Something is capitalist or not, whether or not it reinforces or orients itself around a capitalist mode of production. That's it. That's what capitalism refers to. Um, it doesn't refer to, uh, uh, oh, oh, this is the party that likes money, or this is the party that likes banks, or this is the party that likes, uh, like current modes of, of, of employment contracts or whatever, although that's closer to the truth. Um, it is specifically whether or not this, this ideology is oriented around, presumes capitalist relations between production, labor, etc. That's all. But Mr. President, they had socialists in the name. Yeah, that's true. I mean, hey, the, uh, the, the Communist Party in China has communist in the name. Granted, we have people like Haas in existence, so fuck, not even that's... Oh, even that'll get disputed by a bunch of bozos. Three forms of fascism, you'll like this one. After all of the reading, writing, and recording, I'm a bit burnt out, my voice is kind of shot, so maybe we'll just do something tiny and fun for today. How Good. about that? Let me introduce you to this video. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm already laughing. Why hearing both sides is dangerous. This video got traction on the internet a couple weeks ago for just how ridiculous- Is this too quiet for you guys? I, I can't tell if he's like- it, it sounds more quiet than the previous video. Let me make sure that the audio is up. That's the whole thing sounds. I'm sure we'll have some fun with it today. I do like that comment, though. Critical thinking skills are evil. Yeah, that is generally what partisans think in the end. All right, here we go. I'm ready to be brain rotted, guys. Oh, you're not just ready, my friend. <laughs> you, you, are, uh, you are ahead of the current on this one. This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my oh Patreon. Oh my god. In some other news, I... I, uh... Oops. oops. Can't do two times speed. At least not for the recording. Recently started a podcast with Hakeem and Ugopnik. It's oh called my the Deep god. Podcast, and it's a show dedicated to helping listeners shake off the capitalist programming we've all been subjected <laughs> to over the years. We... <laughs> Look at this. This is like... This is like the tanky version of the they-them household. Four copies of the same Lenin book? First of all. First of all, my brother in Christ, your name is Short Fat Otaku. You can't appreciate, like, a little slice of life cartoon. Secondly, oh my god, this guy's such an idiot. It's not four copies of the same Lenin book. First off, let me, let me show you. Where are we? Here we go. Let me show you what a Lenin book looks like, okay? This is State and Revolution. Um, his books were short, okay? He, he was not a treatise writer for the most... I don't think he actually wrote anything very long. Um, he wrote uh, correspondence, he wrote articles, he wrote pamphlets. Uh, they're actually very robust pamphlets, uh, theoretically. They've got problems. Like, they're, they're not uncontroversial, but then nothing interesting is. This is going to be not four volumes of the same Lenin book. This is going to be a four-volume set of probably Lenin's complete writings. Which you've evidently never seen. Um, this is something that, uh, somebody who, uh, like, actually has, like, a thorough grasp of the material. I don't know if any of these people do it. I haven't watched their stuff in forever. And I don't have a, a massively thorough grasp of Lenin either. But, um, this is something that, uh, somebody would own if they're referring to Lenin a lot in their, their stuff. And they want to cross-reference stuff from, like, wildly disparate texts. I want to see if he's elaborated on this concept in this letter to da, 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 stuff like that, right? There are tons of those all over the place. I'll, uh, I'll show you a liberal example, actually, of exactly that same thing. Imagine if this was divided up into several different volumes. Um... And it has been, as a matter of fact. This is Isaiah Berlin's uh, The Proper Study of Mankind, an anthology of essays. You could, at various points in Isaiah Berlin's career, 
by hardbound editions of several of the books in here. If they were all in the same format, would that be multiple copies of the same Isaiah Berlin book? No. <laughs> no, it would be it, it would be a, a, a set with a uniform aesthetic. That's all. Um like come on, like if come on. Brain dead. Copies of the same Lenin book. Also, the sun. The sun is now the hammer and sickle. You know, the thing that keeps the Earth and the entire solar system in place and going. Provides for all life on Earth. The source of both all of our energy, as well as the fountain for pretty much every single bit of human mysticism. It's a, it's a joke. It's, it's a joke, short fat. You know, a very transcendent metaphysical symbol. Oh, it's all about production guys these people have to lead like the saddest most dreary lives uh hakim i believe is uh i don't know the other two um second thought seems happy enough he, he seems to look cozy and he seems to enjoy what he's doing his last video was actually not bad the one we just saw i had problems with it, it was actually pretty solid um hakim is is like a paramedic i have no idea what the fuck you gopnik is um these these are not miserable people <laughs> Um, I have issues with all of them. Um, I, 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 I think between the lot, though, if I was a, a boring, brain-dead idiot called Short Fat Otaku, whose standards are so low, you're, you actually will republish that Drek Vosh is unironically evil by Doomer politics when he bitched out and hid all of his videos because Sargon stopped love bombing him for it once he started criticizing Dave Chappelle. Um, I'd hate myself, honestly. Like it's no, I, I think I think these guys are way happier than you. All right, let's skip the ad. Let's get to it. The truth isn't always in the middle. Sometimes you have to pick a side. This week, we're talking about having left-wing political beliefs. Now, this might sound like we're running out of topics. Let's begin. Wow. Um, hey, at least he's honest. <laughs> I have not found myself ever once running out of topics. For me, it's more about, like, what am I inspired to talk about today? It's a joke, Dwight. He's joking. He's doing a funny. It's a bit for the camera. What, what do I have enough data that I think I can talk about it today? There's a bunch of topics that I would love to talk about, but I, I just don't feel like I'm ready for them yet. But I've never once felt like I'm, I'm out of things to say. You know what I mean? Oftentimes, it can feel like having a strong, ideological, and staunchly left-wing political opinion is seen as an inherently bad thing, especially according to liberal politicians. That's because it is. Biden wait, wait, wait. Hang, hang on. What was that? Thing, especially according to liberal politicians. Wait ideological, and staunchly left-wing political opinion is seen as an inherently bad thing, especially according to liberal politicians. That's because it is. By Why? Why is it a bad thing? An inherently bad thing. What do you mean it's... Yes, that's what it is. You're gonna, you're gonna elaborate on that? For example, can almost always be found muttering about healing the nation, reaching across the aisle, combating polarization, or not ceding to the extremes. Extremes there with an S at the end. Are you, are you saying that you're not an extremist? I mean, I've heard this sort of thing a lot uh, uh, from the left. They say, you know, I can't believe it. All these people are radicalized. They're radicalized towards the right. You know, Trump has radicalized people. The Proud Boys, blah, blah. And yeah, Trump fomented a fucking coup, you imbecile. No, he's not saying he's not an extremist. He's saying extremist is used to sideline people who have real critiques of, of current systems because there's a fetishization of those systems going on, which you're engaging in because you think that anything that critiques those systems in such a way as the systems have to be revised as a result is an extremist slash invalid. The, the, the issue isn't that extremism can't be toxic the issue is that the language of extremism uh arbitrarily sidelines critics of a system that is itself extreme it only doesn't appear extreme at the eye of the hurricane where everything seems still and peaceful whereas 
at the exterior, where you have mass poverty, racial injustice, and international exploitation and war, it is far from it. And it's like, well, okay. But then they say, don't let this lead you to despair. Let this radicalize you or something like that. And of course, they'll hand wave this away by saying that, well, our radicalism is good and your radicalism is bad. It's like I said- in Your radicalism is bad. Uh, your, your radicalism is uh, an intensification of the fetishization of a bunch of stodgy oppressive structures that have no merit, that are only there because some group dominated at some point in the recent past. And it's made you in particular comfortable um, uh, or on the flip side, uh, you have Richard Spencer type things like this. This is your, your radicalism is bad. It's first of all, like not even really radicalism in, in a true sense, because it doesn't actually challenge institutions. It's, it's a radical attitude, which takes those institutions and turns them towards toxic ends. But even, even people like, uh, Richard Spencer and, uh, and, um, Nick Fuentes and people like that, they don't want to radically restructure the system. They just want to use it to kill the people they dislike and to privilege the people they do like. Which is, is not actually far from the case currently anyways. It's just who fills those categories is slightly modified. It's, it's the poor or it's critics of the system or it's, it's immigrants or it's whatever previous video recently they believe that being left means to be good and moral and just and to not be left means to be evil and immoral and unjust and if you've been watching zachary i recommend you actually like watch the the hearings because they go into this in detail there's several hours of content here through my channel for a long time you already know the holes in that logic and those holes are still there if you flip it the other way around too i've heard some fucking morons out there say no right good left evil no no that's still just as bad but i assume we'll have to get into why as we watch this no it's not just as bad that that is that is far worse. Um, right, good, left, evil results in a whole lot of innocent people being deprived, oppressed, and killed. Uh, left, good, right, evil results in a whole bunch of people who are already in power and who are already killing and depriving a whole bunch of people um, having serious pushback from uh, the people who, who adopt that mindset. There is no objective good or evil about any of this, unfortunately. That's that's the way the world is. However, um, one of these two attitudes uh, hurts the vast majority of people. Uh, one of them introduces the chance that their lot might be improved. If Democrats lost the latest election, it is always because they didn't listen or talk to the undecided voters in the center enough. And if they won, well, now it's time to reach across the aisle and do politics the right way by hearing the other side out. Yes, and ironically. I know it sounds strange, but uh, if you lose an election in a democracy, that means your ideas weren't popular. It's wild to see- No, it doesn't. Not at all. It may be, for example, that you're in a situation of crisis and there may be slim pickings in terms of what's on offer. So it might be that one side um, had a massive advantage in terms of being able to telegraph its presence as something that would seriously address uh, the grievances of the broader population that may or may not be informed at all about what an accurate or what, a, what an adequate solution would look like. Um, whereas other sides are just completely drowned out. Um, and, and there is a tendency to radicalize on grounds of pragmatism from the vantage of political parties. So one of the things that happened uh, during the latter part of the Weimar Republic um, is in an attempt to weaken the radical parties, specifically the Nazis and the communists, um, some very ridiculous chancellors uh, proposed re-elections for parliament, just on the fly. And the result was that uh, groups that had failed to make it big in previous elections, bled votes into the parties that did succeed in the previous elections. So that whereas the goal was to allow an opportunity for people to vote for other than the Nazis and the communists, more voted for the Nazis and the communists because these were seen as more viable. You lost all, and, and by the, by the end of uh, Weimar, right prior to Hitler t uh, being appointed uh, chancellor, um, you had the total, basically annihilation of center parties. They had no, they had almost no votes, which means that all of those center voters voted radical. And it's not because they were radical. 
It's not because they believed in the program. It's because they thought that their best bet for getting the outcomes that they wanted was by using a party they didn't necessarily agree with, but that they found more palatable. See them go so mask off, you know? Democracy is only good if we win. You know, for the past two years from the Trumpsters, there's been this anti-democratic sense. Yes, well, it depends on who wins, right? It depends on who wins. The... Hitler didn't come to power because he won the popular vote. Hitler came to power because he was appointed by the people who had the power of the decision in a democratic system. The democratic system is not defined entirely by the fact of a plebiscite. The democratic system is defined by the fact that there is a principle, some kind of individualistic logic feeding up from the individual subject up to legitimizing whoever actually has that legitimi legitim uh, legitimizing authority. Um, we don't cease to become a democracy in between elections, for example, right? So if a democratic process results in a person coming to power who's then able to decide to target for annihilation a large part of the demos, that's a fucking bad thing, short fat otaku. That's bad. It doesn't get a pass because it was democratic. You'd have to be an absolute fool or just a moral monster to think otherwise. Sentiment of democracy has failed. They've already stolen it from us. It's never going to work again. Time's up. We have to revolt against the system. Meanwhile, that's the exact same argument that Vosh gave to Rose Wrist, only coming from the left. Because their base is not enough of the- It's not Rose Wrist. Oh, so he also not Rose Wrist. You can't do these edits in YouTube Studio. This means that he literally- this fucker is so lazy. He, oh my god, he is so lazy. He just did a text overlay instead of just re-recording at five seconds of referring to, oh my god. Anyways. The country for them to win another federal election. But if they did stuff that would turn off this uh, block of people. It won't matter. They matter. Because they'll rig it all. They'll have already won. Right, okay, so then you're saying that means in two years before the next midterm, you're saying they would pass stuff that would actually pretty much kill democracy. What midterm? You, I'm if saying, you, if they, the, 2024, 2026. What midterm? No, he's actually, he's actually right here. Remember the context is, uh, we already have one party that was largely culpable. Again, a sitting president was largely culpable for an attempted coup where they would actually, uh, do violence to members of government in order to brute force the outcome of an election that they wanted. Um, you know what it's called when you're playing a game of chess with someone and you see them literally taking your pieces off the board out of turn in order to cheat and you're insisting on playing by the rules still, hoping that you'll win? That's called being a fucking moron. You, I don't think you understand, and this is why I use the rhetoric that I do. We're up. Time's up. This is not a left versus right thing. This is a normative institutional politics versus populist outsider politics thing. Where liberal institutions are legitimate only in so far as they give you the outcome that you want to see. And obviously. Obviously. Unless you're treating politics like a game. Because the purpose to politics is to get the kinds of organizations that we want. It's to make by deliberate decision and action and planning, our societies succeed. If we were just referring to blind processes to sort this out, you would never get a liberal system. You wouldn't. We don't naturally arrive at liberal systems. They're not meritocratic. They're appealing to uh, communities that already have the beginnings of a revolutionary impulse. This is why the origins of liberal thought is with Hobbes in the English Civil War with the total breakdown of traditional authority. You have no idea what you're talking about. He has no idea what he's talking about. This guy's just, a, this guy's just an absolute bonehead. And if, for whatever reason, your side fails a fair contest, now suddenly it's not just the fact that you're unpopular or your idea- No, it's, it's not a fair contest. It's not a fair contest. If it's a contest within a system that is framed by organizations that premise um, extreme uh, wealth accruing 
activities of exploitation, and you are an outsider criticizing those systems of exploitation, that system is going to be far more radically frictive against your positions um, than those of people who are uncritical of them. The rules presume certain modes of behavior and activity that themselves presume the very thing that you're criticizing. Um, case in point, uh, it is actually used as a rhetorical tool against leftists that, oh, so you're against capitalism. I see you've tweeted this from your iPod. Right? It's, 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 it's extremely difficult. It is not extremely difficult, um, for some coked out bozo like Miley Annapolis to get on stage and go, uh, feminists are cringe, right, bro? are bad or you suck it's that the entire system must be rigged against you it's such a a, a brain rotted way to view politics the you're going to add okay you can't just say shit you f imbecile like are you going elaborate don't just say oh that's so stupid you need to explain why it's stupid you can't just make broad declarations this is inherently evil this is a stupid way to view this and then just leave it silent afterwards do, do you do you not do you not know do you not know why you're saying these things? Do you not have an explanation to hand? Why are you saying them then? Well, I know why you're saying them then. Because there are a horde of really stupid people who will pay for this shit. Because no, the good ideas do not get filtered through. The bad ideas um, are, are only adhered to precisely because there's a low barrier to entry for them. And very cynical and corrupt people will pay for them way to go is always to push a little more towards the right and be a little more amenable to conservative discourse. What does fair contest even mean? It means it's a game. He's treating it like a game because there are no stakes for him personally. This is the difference between politics and a game, okay? And this is why liberal, liberal ideology gamifies politics. In a game, you have rules that are set up for the possibility of infinite matches, right? You can have infinite matches of chess. Um, the outcome is determined by a combination of chance and strategy by the different uh, parties to the game. So a game of chess, right? The rules are the same. Uh, who starts with white or black? That's determined on like a coin toss or something. Um, uh, or, or typically what you do is you hold like both uh, the, the black and the white queens and somebody has to pick. Whichever they pick, they start with, you know? Um, <laughs> veil of ignorance stuff. Um, the rules are equal, and inequality is introduced as a consequence of the game playing out. In politics, you don't do that. In politics, you arbitrarily decide to make decisions that tend towards the unity and the security and the safety and the prosperity of the whole. And what that actually looks like is going to be sort of ideologically dependent. But you don't start off with, let's set up some rules and just, okay? Politics is not divination. It's not gambling. If it is, you're doing it very wrong. Um, or more accurately, you're doing it very stupidly because you can't predict the future. And you have to think you can predict the future if you think that this system will necessarily not tend towards the ultimate dissolution of the state. And if you're willing to accept the ultimate dissolution of the state, then you should shut up because you're not fit to be commenting on politics. Oh my God, how, how can you say this with a straight face? I know, dude, we're a minute and a half in and I've already like ranted three times. I don't think, I don't think my brain's gonna survive getting through this much commie gobbledygook. How Preach, can you brother. say with a straight face that things haven't been moving consistently leftward over time. Okay. Short Fed Otaku. Disney Plus uh, putting non-white characters as leads in their limited series on a streaming platform is not society moving left. That's not what that means. Like, what's he, what's he going to point to? The existence of trans people? We, we aren't, we aren't closeting the gays enough? What do you mean society is moving left? You just had a president who was elected on a platform of putting walls up to protect the state against the barbarian hordes of the non-whites. 
the alternative to that was a a a neoliberal warhawk like you're you're no <sighs> Here, here's the thing right this is the grand irony so there, there's a there's a there's a quote there's a quote that um gets repeated a lot in reactionary circles uh from i think it's i think it's actually from moldbug and it's that cthulhu swims left and the idea is that the left is the left ultimately endorses chaos chaos the left endorses a uh a situation in which laws are not respected and there's just an endless pouring towards enemy the, the opposite of law right enemy so nomos is law anomy is the the absence of law that's not true. Um, the left is oriented primarily against the fetishization of, of uh, structures that have themselves arrived at the tail end of an anomic process, of an irrational process. We don't determine our ethics by reference to the processes of evolution. Animals in the wild eat their own young. We determine our ethics based upon a combination of what History has has uh, conditioned our preferences uh, to to privilege, um, and what our reason and our inquiry have determined is unnecessary and hindering to maximizing that. This is a very nomic, pronomic process. This is this is a very uh, 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 this is a very rational, forward thinking, and plan attitude towards politics um this is in fact a point of criticism that a lot of conservatives will also make because there's sort of like a, a, a very there's like multiple personalities going on here with with the right aren't there it's like the the left is anomic they're chaotic they don't want order by the same token the left are a bunch of moral busybodies who just want to order all of society and not allow freedom to flourish um it's actually the opposite. The right fetishizes old structures that have arisen as a result of chaotic interactions between historical elements that they have not scrutinized. Um, they allow these to override human freedom and human potential and human reason and human reason. Um, and uh, additionally, um, they will overplan within the confines of those fetishized objects. Um, on the basis of pure contempt for the freedom of people who are not them. Uh, Cthulhu, unfortunately, uh, swims very much to the right. The true squids swim left. Cthulhu, the invention of, uh, of a gross racist, um, swims to the right. Uh, and appropriately enough, you have a bunch of, uh, mindless cults of death worshippers orbiting around him on the right as well. Because that's what this is. It's the fetishization of processes that they don't understand. Um, whose histories they don't understand. Whose necessity they haven't actually criticized. Um, to the end of well, eventually the destruction of our entire planet. Because what uh, Second Thought was talking about is absolutely correct. We have actually uh, time-critical problems facing us at the level of the species. And right-wing politics is arresting our capacity to address it before it's too late. The 20th century is a century of politics and culture shifting ever leftward. Endless twists on these same slogans have been presented to us by liberal And again, no fucking examples. Society's drifting leftward. What's he got? He's got nothing. Gender neutral bathrooms. For years, with the barely hidden assumption that it's simply the more grown up, reasonable thing to do to have this. President Sunday, Yarvin even recommends fix it. Yarvin is a mold bug. Yarvin uh, recommends fixation by tenacity. <laughs> Regarding that scrutinization of historic structures, recommends that you not read any introductions or critical editions if it's new. Yeah, that's uh. They're not smart. Um, they don't know what thinking is. This kind of pragmatic approach to politics. 
to seek compromise above ideological commitment, to play the game of democracy, quote, the right way. The game of democracy, that's a very, very apt sentence. I don't know if Second Thought realized that, um, but that is that is the critical element of an appropriate analysis, of an accurate analysis of liberal politics. It's a game. It's It's a referral entirely to a process. And the only thing you don't take seriously enough to refer entirely to a process is a game. When you, uh, when you have a family member that you love and that you have to care for, you do not refer their well-being to processes. Not unless those processes are either very well understood or unavoidable. And in this case, that is not the case. There is no metaphysical demand on us to refer all uh, political decisions and the future and character and ethics of, of our, of our communities, uh, to the blind procedure of things that just happen to be in existence now smashing against each other like billiard balls. Having opinions that are irreconcilable with the opposition is just being childish. The mature thing to do is sit down and talk and figure out a way to coexist, no matter what the other side says. In my video, The Three Forms of Fascism, I pointed out, after having read that giant stack of books, oh my one of God. the core components okay. of fascism. You fucking idiot. You stupid. Okay. Book time. What do we got here? Either right nor left. That one's probably okay. The Road to Serfdom. Hayek, really? He's going to equivocate between... Moving on. I don't know the vampire economy, fascist interaction, but the open society and its enemies is one of the worst books on on political philosophy I have ever read. Um, his 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 critique of historicism um, basically rests on he does actually interestingly enough what William L. Shirer does, and he takes a haphazard and dilettantish uh, understanding of contemporary political ideologies in his time, um, and compares them based on word associations uh, positively with um, thinkers way in the past. So for, for William Shire, he uh, he connects uh, the Protestant Reformation with modern Nazi ideology, which is insane. Um, and in the case of Karl Popper, the open side and its enemies, he, uh, he refers um, common doctrines about uh, any kind of, any kind of, uh, uh, What's the word I want to I want to find here? Any kind of understanding of history as involving processes, as a kind of uh, insane predictive historicism that people all the way back to Heraclitus were engaging in. Um, historicism, in his view, which is not what historicism actually refers to in general parlance, historicism referring to the idea that history is governed by laws um, by which you can predict the future. Which not which nobody from Heraclitus to Marx actually believes, at all. It just doesn't come up, doesn't happen, because he he didn't understand the people he was writing about. Um, Mein Kampf for some reason. Um, the origins of okay, so this is Hannah Arendt, the origins of totalitarianism. I don't recommend this book generally as a history. It's interesting from the vantage of liberal political philosophy. Arendt narrativizes to the extreme. She is not taken seriously by historians of Nazi Germany today for some pretty serious reasons. Um, I'm not familiar with these other ones. My recommendations. I've got three for you. The first um, will be the introduction well, actually, no, that's not good. This is going to be the second. Um, where are we? Where are we? Where are you? There we are. Brilliant. Okay. I have three. The first is going to be uh, Eric D. Weitz's uh, Weimar Germany. Um, this is an extremely readable. Here, I'll put closer to the camera so you can see the title. This is an extremely uh, readable but accurate and, and elucidating uh, account of the um, um the the processes uh by which the nazis came to power and the instabilities inherent in the system that uh in which the the nazis came to power that that led to that eventuality a more robust account of the actual political decision making that led to that 
is going to be found in Constitutional Theory by Carl Schmitt, um, who was an actual advisor to both uh, people in government during the Nazi regime and leading up to it. Um, and then finally, the most robust account that I have found, um, not so on the level of political philosophy, but more generally, um, Richard J. Evans' The Coming of the Third Reich uh, is, is, I cannot recommend this enough. This is actually the beginning of a three-part trilogy. Um, I've only read the first volume. Fantastic. But those three. No, what did I draw? There we go. read that giant stack of books one of the core components of fascism is by the way if he's read that giant stack of books i'll eat my cardigan the rejection of compromise it's the rejection of the idea that people with different views can actually come together and hammer out an agreement where each side gets at least some of what they want and then they can go away in my opinion the only really good hannah rent book that i would recommend is um and, and I, I i have serious problems with it is the human condition it's an excellent sort of wide survey of uh, the history of political philosophy. It's got problems, but even a problematic book can be extremely useful because as you, you go through it, you get the, the, the rough of it, and then you contrast it with your actual reading of those thinkers as you go through the actual, like, the history of the, the thoughts that she's accounting for. And as a result of that, you end up with a really robust and critical understanding of those thinkers. And ideally, you're doing this with a number of people, not just with a rent, but... That's a, that's a good way to go. I don't, I don't, I never recommend people just go chronologically. Um, it can be useful, especially if you're an undergraduate to have that in the back of your mind. And so I'm not opposed to, uh, for example, like great books programs or whatever, um, where you just kind of go through like the canon of political philosophy. And then afterwards you start reading the critical stuff. The problem though, is that there's a tendency, uh, then to start fetishizing those things and the, the, the. Uh, lists of books that those courses tend to include will also tend themselves to privilege a non-critical uh, spread of sources. When in fact, like what gets onto that list is not truly representative of the actual spread of ideas that gave rise to those books in the first place or allowed those to prevail. It's just going to be the fact of those ones prevailing for whatever reason. And often it's because there was an ideological prevalence that privileged those books over alternatives. Sometimes they're just really good. You know, maybe a little bit dissatisfied, but ultimately at peace. Or at the very least, they can just agree to leave each other alone. And that a core component of fascism is a rejection of the idea of compromise through politics. Hang on, let's let's hear this again. Sorry. Sorry. He, so he read he read a big read a big stack of books. Where, where's that stack of books? Where's the stack of books, man? Show me the stack of books. Where was it? It was. everything to be socialist. They want a post fact Sometimes referred to as the marketplace of okay, ideas thesis. And yeah, he said pretty much what a post-fascist would say. His problem with liberalism is plurality. Socialists want everything to be socialist. They want all non-socialism to be stamped out. The truth is, hearing dissident ideas out is an important mechanism of change. That's how you bring new ideas into the fold. You but hang on, he's not hes not advising we don't hear both. I, again, this is why the title's really uh, screwing over second thought here. He's not actually advising that we don't hear both sides out. Was he, what he is advising is we don't allow a, bri a blind um, process that is dictated by economic success uh, to govern which sides are present in the hearing. Because that's what's at issue. The issue is not that hearing different ideas... Uh, isn't important. It absolutely is. The issue is that you're actually not hearing that many different ideas. You're hearing only those ideas that are uh, accepted, that are permitted by the already existing system to rise to the top as foam, right? That's, that's the problem examine them critically you say hey you know does this work maybe parts of it does maybe parts of it doesn't you take what works you put you bring that into the establishment you make things better as a result that's why you debate ideas that's why you don't just ideologically stick to oh my god his response to a critique of the marketplace of ideas dogma which is stupid it's so fucking stupid 
as if like by sheer magic, if you remove the megaphones from toxic bad actors, they would somehow still succeed. His response to the critique of the marketplace of ideas is just to dogmatically insist upon the marketplace of ideas. This is a moron. One theory isolated from its effects on reality. If you're complaining about the marketplace of ideas, it is because your ideas can't compete. He's so dumb. Buddy, you know how stupid you are. We both, we both know. I know. I'm listening to you talk. You're dumb as a brick, okay? You have way more subscribers. I think you have more, I think you have uh, more than double the subscribers of Second Thought. I could be wrong on that. Um, let me, let me, let me see actually. I'm a little bit curious. He's got a, uh... oh, Second Thoughts. No, never mind. Never mind. Second Thoughts got 1.45 million. Well, maybe there's something to it. Bad ideas have been winning recently. Fascist, nationalist, and identitarian politics have been on the rise for years at this point throughout the liberal world. Am I th oh, I think of Ugopnik. Ugopnik has like, uh... no, I think he's actually, I think Ugopnik's at like the uh, 100,000 100, level too. Let's see here. Yeah, you got next at 121k. I, I I remember talking to a lot of these people when they were brand new. So Hakim at one point had like 1,000. I remember the first time I spoke to him. Um, I think I think it was around that level because that's when we were both criticizing the academic agent way back in the day. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill. Fuck, I'm a liberal now. He's right. The better ideas won. And, and you think this is because of the marketplace of ideas? No, dude. It's because we haven't had a marketplace of ideas for a long fucking time. Okay. This guy and I are probably going to agree, even though underneath the skin he's probably a post-fascist, just like most online socialists are nowadays, but we're probably going to agree that neo-fascists are bad, okay? And the guys we're looking at currently on screen, they are a blending of neo-fascist and post-fascist. And okay, neo-fascism, bad. Got it. Do you think these guys came to believe what they believe because of the marketplace of ideas? Because they listened to well-reasoned debates that were freely had and the best ideas won out? No, that's obviously not what happened because you can't have well-reasoned debates on what these people clearly believe anymore. The whole point of going to- What? So wait, is, is hearing both sides good or not? Is hearing bo Wait, so so we can't have a reasonable debate on what these people believe? Then what the fuck are you talking about? Is he is he just Is he deciding that certain voices are too toxic to be admitted to the public discourse? <sighs> to university and getting a liberal arts degree, whether that be in literature or, or in whatever, is that it teaches you how to read, how to write, how to- No, no, if, if you, if you're going to university, you know how to read and write. It doesn't, going to university does not teach you how to read and write. If you're going, if you are going to university to learn how to read and write, no, 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 no. A university is a community of people engaged in research to acquire knowledge, okay? And a part of that involves education as well, but it is it is not a place for teaching people how to read and write. That's that's the public education system. Um people people learn to read and write in the course of just setting themselves up for functionary positions at at private businesses. This is not publicly speak, how to think critically. And these are very important skills, regardless of any other expertise you might have. If you can solidly put together an argument, man, that will take you far in life. That will get you influence. That will get you opportunities. It is an extremely important skill to have. And Maybe that's why uh, Second Thought is outdoing you in the subs department, my friend. And part of cultivating that skill, at least in a university setting, is that you have to be confronted with ideas that are outside 
the orthodoxy, whether that be in politics or anything else. What is the best way for your average, let's say, politically non-aligned, you know, apolitical normal dude in the West to encounter neo-fascist political theory? Should it be in a university setting where open debate is discussed and allowed, where they can really drill down on some of these topics and figure out, hey, why is this a bad idea? Have a real discussion on these topics so that once you get out of university, you understand what they are, you understand why they're bad, and you're armed against them. You're ready to play the game. That's not what university is for. University is not, it is not for uh, teaching people the rules and giving them a roadmap. First of all, again, you're, you're assuming the outcome of a blind process. Um, how do universities run? What are they first and foremost? It's like, uh, ask, ask somebody what, uh, what kind of business is a theater? It's food services. It's like, it's like a McDonald's. It's not about the movies. Um, what, uh, what do you think a university is? The university, qua the university, like the, the, the thing that we would call a university in ancient Greece as today, that's a community of scholars. But the university institution, that's a business. It pays people to stand in front of a, uh, a classroom and to talk for hours and hours and hours. And who pays them? Donors. Who are the donors going to be? They're going to be people with money. They're going to be people who are profiting from the current system. And who are the people who are going to be able to exert economic pressure on the university to structure or orient or limit the discourse in a particular way? It's going to be the donors. Politicians, industrial magnates, etc. Which is why, again, um, when uh, when conservatives get uh, get pushed off of stage by students, they become rich, and they become important as a result. When left wing professors are removed from positions because they criticized oil or a, a cruel Medicare plan that left out the poor, um, not a sound. Silence. It's money. Like most things. Um, or do you completely censor everything because the ideas are too harmful to spread around? And then once the person finally encounters them out in the real world, long after they're out of uh, university learning school mode, where they've been told for years and years and years, you can't talk about that. Don't talk about that. It's bad. We'll ban you if you talk about it. So they have no arguments against it. Only just a dogma that tells them it's bad. It's bad. Don't think it. Don't think it. Don't speak it. It's bad. And then they encounter someone in, you know, the dark corners of the internet who says, Actually, I'll tell you all the secrets. Okay, here's the fundamental problem with his analysis here. No, he is correct. Like, there are people in university who do this. They're usually students. They're usually other students. So what you are talking about is the friction that results from students with different ideological positions clashing. Um, that friction is what the marketplace of ideas actually looks like in practice. Where you have people with strong ethical values running against people with uh ethical values that are opposite them or rather aesthetic sensibilities that are masquerading as ethical values running against them um and uh and one side growing impatient and well both sides growing impatient but one side growing impatient with the other's incorrigibility recognizing that given there's a lower barrier to entry and that given that their position is critical of current systems, that therefore they are at an inherent structural disadvantage, they are refusing to play a game against a cheating player. I moved leftward because I attempted to play the game very seriously. 
Um, I went into classes with a very left-wing title, the very left-wing subject. Indigenous politics, feminist politics, speech and harm, things like that. And I took it seriously. And I read very carefully, and I had my ideas actually challenged. I had my positions actually challenged. Ideas is, gra is uh, aggrandizing them too much. I hadn't criticized them enough. They weren't really ideas, or at the very least, they weren't my ideas. Um, and as, as a consequence, I developed a very robust understanding of both, and why the ones, the presumptions that I came into those programs with was, were very wrong. Fundamentally, the reason why people on the right and fascists and, and what have you, the reason why they are not being swayed in university is not because uh, a few university activists were mean to them. It's not because there was an uppity trans person in, in, some, in some classroom somewhere that, that uh, made a scene when they they started debating whether or not they were the gender that they insisted they be referred to as as if that isn't like massively insulting and 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 um and and publicly embarrassing as as, as a as a thing to do to somebody in a, in a public setting um the reason why is because they came into the university hating in advance, the things about which they were going to learn, and so they didn't. People come out of university being very right-wing. The majority of university professors, this is a little secret for you, are right-wing. Truly. Um, they won't say they're right-wing. There is political currency in them not saying they're right-wing. But they are. You think someone like Stephen Shu, uh, who who will go on to uh, Stefan Molyneux and talk about how he's he doesn't believe there could possibly be some invisible miasma resulting in racial disparities in IQ. Do you think he gets into a position where he gets to decide who gets funding in scientific research outside of his field because the university is dogmatically opposed to racists? God no. God, no. No, 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 no. No, what happened was... Uh, at a very early point, some feminists became very effective at using social media. And they massively inflated their presence. Feminist frequency, people like that. Big Red, you remember? And uh, because because they were... Because they were proactive on that front, um, there was a general impression that they were prevalent and ascending. And in a sense, they were. However, everybody bought the bullshit and believed that they were actually ruling the world. Media companies started trying, in a desperate attempt to stay hip and, and, and up with it and cool with the kids, they started making really ham-fisted efforts to appear what eventually would be characterized as quote-unquote woke. Um, and, uh, people in universities, they bought the bullshit too. And so a lot of people started masking themselves. I've been in history seminars in one of the most liberal universities in Canada. And I have seen how when a professor was listening to a, uh, socialist student's, uh, essay, put their pen down. Because we have presentations and he's rating them halfway through. Pen down. That's when you're dead. Um, there is tremendous bigotry against the political left in universities. It, of course, criticizes the university structure itself as itself a beneficiary of the capitalist system. Um, universities will endlessly protect uh, sexist behavior and sexual predatory behavior by staff and by up-and-coming students. There's a reason why these are all scandals. It's not typically... Oh, such and such a student or such and such a professor sexually molested some other colleague or student or whatever. It's typically, this was found out by the public after it was known by staff 
and then action was taken. We're going to take a couple minutes break, and we're going to finish this. All right? We'll be right back. Hello again, we're back to it. <clears throat> I just realized I forgot to put the uh, transition animation on the uh, the YouTube scale cam. That's frustrating. I'll have to do that tonight. Let's continue.
read my rambling, ridiculous 1488 page manifesto. Which of I'm good, thank you. Those two people is going to be more vulnerable to being radicalized by this sort of rhetoric. It's clearly the second one. And the second one exists not in a marketplace of ideas, but in a system of censorship. Femicides, the killing of members of the LGBT community, anti-Semitism, the murder of black and Asian Americans, all of them are trending upwards. Hold on a second, hold on a second. Okay, like I, I get the LGBT stuff, right? Club Q shooting, there was the Pulse shooting a few years back, but black and Asian, who's committing those hate crimes, buddy? It, looking that up might shock you. It's because politics is Black people are not committing hate crimes against black people, you fucking idiot. ...isn't all about ideas. In other words, ideas and their success are not just a matter of argumentation. They are heavily conditioned by material circumstances. Okay, so this is the, the socialist materialist conditions uh, analysis of the world, where ideals don't actually exist. And it's all just, it's all just realist politics, right? What? I, I gotta listen to that again. That was... ...of the world. Where ideals don't... ...by material circumstances. Okay, so this is the... So he said material circumstances. Like me, this triggers short fat otaku a little bit. Let's see what he says. The socialist materialist conditions uh, analysis of the world. Where ideals don't actually exist. And it's all just, it's all just realist politics, right? No, you fucking idiot. Ideals are oriented around the stuff in the world. They are ideals concerning what, right? This is not a platonic system where you have ideas of things floating on some separate plane to which we little peons in the world have to try and approximate our institutions to. Realist politics is profoundly idealistic. It insists upon the, the hyper-reality, um, not in those terms, the reality of institutions and states as being things that embody specific qualities in all times. Or, or at like a, a more fine-grained level analysis, something like that. This is why realist attitudes in international relations and in politics generally insist upon some notion of uh, state or corporate interest that is basically immutable on a separation of time scale between and within states so that states develop but there is no development between states the development is simply of the game played between states that's the whole doctrine of international anarchy this is going to be too complicated for your tiny tiny brain so uh no, no. It's an anti-idealistic position, which in turn is an anti-realist position. You're you're astonishingly ignorant on this point. Realist politics is literally based on liberal idealism. Yeah, it, it's based on the fetishization of the liberal state as the fundamental building block of the international system. He he has no idea what he's talking about. Right. Everything comes out of the material conditions of the people who get the ideas. So liberalism came about not because of any sort of moral impetus, but because of the material conditions of the people who would write liberal theory. Even on this bad understanding of what material conditions mean? Fucking yes, you idiot. Civil war. There was a civil war. People were oppressed economically and religiously, and there was a civil war. And that was the immediate impetus for Hobbes writing an entire treatise, a really, really big one um, on why actually, guys, you tacitly accepted the rule of this government and you want to avoid the state of nature. Therefore, you will avoid civil war at all costs. You will swallow inequality and oppression for the sake of avoiding total destitution. This was an apologetic for monarchical government at its core. It became more than that. He was ingenious. He did some really interesting stuff. He laid the groundwork for much more uh, 
progressive and much more sophisticated thinking. But fundamentally, fundamentally, without the threat of total social dissolution, without the material conditions, liberalism doesn't exist. Which is why it didn't exist for thousands and thousands of years before. It's so, that's like a very basic, like surface level description of what's going on here. I'm too lazy to go break out any books and uh, quote you anything for this video. But the basic I know. Basic idea is that everything flows from material conditions, and nothing is done for reasons that exist outside of material conditions, and that's just not true. Kraut did an excellent video recently. I forget which one it was. Kraut, I don't hate Kraut. Kraut's done some okay stuff, but he's shallow. He is shallow. He's just not a very critical thinker. He relies on very few sources. He relies generally on populist sources, which is not the end of the world. But there are reasons why in political science you do not see critical people actually relying on people like Francis Fukuyama. Where he described the conversion of pagans in Europe to Christianity, where missionaries went out into places where there was no material benefit in actually doing so, but they did it because God commanded them to. Okay, and this is, this is where uh, being particular about what material conditions actually means in this technical sense is important. Because material conditions does not refer to, oh, did you personally get money for this? Material conditions refers to how the relationship between, or let me put it a different way, the way in which your community metabolizes the world, if you want to go like really cosmic about this, metabolizes the energy in the world that we get from the sun or whatever, um, that determines what are the relevant things that you address with your ideology, right? Um, you care about their souls as opposed to what? See, they did it for free for a reason. They did it for free because they were convinced that there was a very material, in essence, in terms of its description, reward for doing so, both for them and for the people they were converting. They had genuine compassion and feeling in a lot of cases, as well as a profound level of arrogance, but leaving that aside. Um, right off the bat, we have an immediate commentary uh, upon the relationship between human well-being and the material of the world. It's negative, but it's still there. It orients that discussion. Right? It's, it's literally the material conditions. Put another way, the conditions of the material of the relevant world. What do you recognize as, to use Gibsonian language a little bit loosely, like affordances, things that you can grapple with? What are the relevant things? Incidentally, the, uh, and this is, this is a good point by Grammar Kami, um, the, uh, spread of religion was a power play. Um, churches were aligned with states. One church had a state. And, uh, they competed for converts and territory. How did the, uh, how did the Canadian state go about assimilating, i.e., deleting or genociding as someone might put it more crudely uh the frustrating existence of the native population that just just refused to uh refused to just become a con a, a comfortable non-entity with which the government had to deal they had uh the church educate them well i mean first they kidnapped their children but they had the church try to educate them out of their culture They did it for spiritual reasons, not material ones. Okay, but, but, first of all, <laughs> spiritual reasons, what the fuck does that mean? You, you, you saw the, you saw the ghost essence come out of their souls when they were taught? No. No. They did it for reasons that we labeled as spiritual. That's different. We don't need to buy into the existence of the spiritual as a domain, or into substance dualism or something. 
in order to describe what missionaries did. They targeted who they targeted because of colonial relations of economics and power. And they were concerned with the things they were concerned with reflecting those same. And this is probably the biggest flaw with the materialist lens is that people regularly don't do things for material reasons. If you see things only through a materialist lens, you are blind to the majority of the human experience, which is, by the way, a big reason why socialists appear to be so like amoral, corrupt, robotic, anti-human. What the I don't know. I see a dipshit here who is just burned lifetimes of work by far more virtuous and hardworking people than himself uh, to make a crappy YouTube video to get him some easy clicks. No, I don't think leftists on the whole seem to be generally more immoral. I think they generally seem to be disgusting to f worthless schlubs like this um, who are incapable of thinking, whose only contribution is to project their unscrutinized disgust uh, out into the world and to try and monetize it um, whose conception of virtue is basically just masturbating to a picture of themselves on the wall. The neoliberal era has produced, which is to say massive inequality, the death of the welfare state compromise, and perpetual war has been seized upon by fascist rhetoric. Where socialists can explain this general worsening of conditions for all but an extremely wealthy minority through an analysis of systems and institutions, fascists hijack these explanations and transform them by blaming what's wrong with the world not on systems, but on the existence of the wrong kind of people, thereby protecting existing institutions. Oh my god, hold on. This Doesn't this say stop totalitarianism? Yeah, it's anti-communist and it's anti-LGBT. But it's also anti-Nazi. I think this is probably Poland, right? Like yeah, they're, they're, this, is, this is why liberals like yourself are actually right-wing when it comes down to it. Again, they're anti-Nazis. Until they're not. Which is in fact what happened. Because the annihilation of the centrist parties in Weimar... They weren't literally annihilated. The centrists voted for the Nazis. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, how about this? Let's apply your logic back to you. Are you suggesting, oh, well, they may be LGBTQ, anti-LGBTQ, but they're anti-Nazi too. You know, you give a little, you get a little. You see this stuff in Poland all the time. Yeah. These are three ideologies that are totalitarian in nature. Interesting. So it really is just the existence of trans people then. Oh, you buy into that. Oh, well, this simplifies things quite nicely then. Um, Short Fat Otaku, you showed uh, a couple of uh, what you call post-fascists or neo-fascists or neo-Nazis earlier doing uh, Roman salutes at the beginning of this video. Um, uh, ask not for whom the Nazi hiles, he hiles for thee. They want everything to be them. The fact that he showed this image with all the rest of them is just, it's fucking mind blowing to me. The reason that Tucker Carlson has the most watched show in America and there are no leftists on major television. Shirt Fighter Taku is definitely not a liberal. He's several thumbnails doing the white power symbol. No, he is a liberal. Here's a, here's, here's a bit of a black pill for you. Um, liberals are partisans, ultimately, of the system. If they believe that a Nazi will sustain the system, they will allow the Nazi to come into power. In fact, that's quite literally how the Nazis came into power. Um, the, uh, the conservatives in authority who were the heads of a liberal state, um, wanted to return to, to monarchy. And uh, monarchy, by the way, is not anti-liberal. You can have liberal monarchies. Liberalism is not specifically a mode of electing your head of state. Um, they thought they could control Hitler, and so they put him into a position of power um, 
in order to uh, to outpace the return of parliamentary politics that would coincide with the return, the bouncing back from the Great Recession, which was largely uh, what gave the Nazis their early leads in, in elections. Because they, they weren't, they weren't, uh, they never were a majority, um, but they did get more votes than everybody else. Not combined, but more votes than everybody else taken singularly. Um, they were on the decline when Hitler was made chancellor. They were on the decline. They were losing votes. They were stagnating. Uh, Goebbels journal talks about how this isn't good guys. Uh, our, our growth, it's peaking. We're about as good as we can get. Hitler was made chancellor to sustain a system that was threatened. By uh, growing equality and wealth, actually. Um, liberal institutions as a preference are fine. And in a just world where you don't have uh, the inheritance of uh, centuries of colonialism and oppression and oftentimes very recent extreme racism and, and political oppression and even murder. Um, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. With adjustments, you can have a liberal system that is very profitable and just and happy, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with that. The problem people have is that the system is being used as an excuse for the abuses of particular actors as a bludgeon against the remedies proposed by actors who are directly affected by it. Which is why ultimately when push comes to shove, the liberals and the quote-unquote centrists are just the more cowardly part of the right wing. Networks isn't because he has the best ideas, but because he has the ideas that Fox's billionaire owner is willing to pay for. No billionaire wants to fund an anti-capitalist pundit. That's like partially true. The capitalist owners of Fox News are definitely paying for Tucker Carlson to be there. But here, you know what? I'll, I'll adopt your materialist lens, dude. If Fox News didn't make any money off of Tucker being there, <clears throat> he wouldn't be there. The issue isn't that you're being suppressed by capital. Yes, precisely. Precisely. It's not spiritual. Or rather, spirit is downstream from capital. This is the insight of Marx. This is the critique of, uh, well, I guess it's implied in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, where Hegel treats the state as if this is the ultimate unit of, um, of political development, where uh, ethics has to be situated, sorry, rather, progress is progress of the state. Human uh, self-awareness, our, our, our awareness of ourselves as or a complete awareness of ourselves and our place in the universe that is brought about by and through the state. Um, Marx points out, well, actually, no. The state form itself is downstream from particular relationships of production um, and resource extraction and metabolism. Um, you're fetishizing something that is accidental. This cannot be the basis of true self-awareness because we have a blind spot. We're fetishizing the state itself. We're treating that as something that is more given when it's not. Obviously, obviously there is a market for what Tucker is selling because the center of gravity determined by the actual material conditions, which again, second thought botched in his use of, uh, because the actual material conditions are such that Human beings are oriented, if they are left uninterfered with and uncritical, to be more receptive to that kind of logic than the logic of critics of the system, because they are themselves products of it. 
in a university setting where open debate is discussed and allowed, where they can really drill down on some of these topics and figure out, hey, why is this a bad idea? Have a real discussion on these topics so that once you get out of university, you understand what they are. You understand why they're oh, bad. Oh, I think we, did we, did we relocate ourselves? Did I click a thing? Actually doing so, but they did it because God commanded them to. They did it for spiritual reasons. The murder of black and community, where missionaries went out, robots and institutions in Poland all the time. Left materialist lens, dude. If Fox News didn't make any money off of Tucker being there, he wouldn't be there. The issue isn't that you're being suppressed by capitalists, though I'm sure that's part of it. The bigger issue is that you're just unpopular. Again, crucially, the the uh, liberal logic um, is circular. So it is the best ideas are what survive the filter and come out on top. And we've determined this because, well, if they weren't the best ideas, they wouldn't have survived the filter and come out on top, right? It's, it's a very basic failure in reasoning. It's, it's actually quite astonishing to see people do this in real time and not realize it. Um, it's, it's, it's like, like short fight otaku, you have to, let's be real for a second. Okay. Let me, let me calm myself down a little bit. You're not that stupid, surely. Like you, you, you must, you must be able to, to understand that when you say, well, um, clearly, I mean, first of all, we don't have a marketplace of ideas apparently, but we'll just ignore that thing you said earlier. Um, clearly the, the, uh, the, the best ideas are being filtered through because they're being filtered through. Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, he is that dishonest, to be honest. It shows through the way he presents things and the way he speaks. I mean, like, there are different kinds of dishonest, though. There's the kind of dishonest where you let yourself cheat because you're sure you're right, and you cheat because you know you're wrong. And I think... Short Fat Otaku is the type who lets himself cheat because he's sure he's right. Um, he's equally dishonest, but he's dishonest as a consequence of arrogance over malice. Although the line gets blurred, as, as, as you saw. The existence of trans people is a totalitarian ideology for this man. And this is frustrating, because what do liberals do about this state of affairs? Well, first, they usually refuse to recognize that a system of private ownership of media institutions creates these consequences. You can tell this guy's an American, right? Because he views things only through that American lens. Canada has publicly funded news media, the UK has it, the EU has it, a bunch of countries have it, and yet all those problems are still there. It's almost like the capitalist mode of production. Hey. Uh... Canadians watch Fox News. Did you know that? We, we, we watch tons of it. I watched tons of it growing up. Um, and uh, public news broadcasts are rarely um, at all ideologically uh, saturated except in terms of what they will not show and in terms of the physical appearance of the presenters. That's basically it. It's a joke. Isn't the problem here. Something else is going on. The socio-political capitalist system is not neutral to the arguments that inhabit it. Some arguments will win not on their merit, but on their ability to conform with the system and its actors. In practice, some ideas won't get broadcast very much or will get outright censored. Some will be able to roam freely, and some will get a boost. This image is actually pretty important. I'll have to reference Kraut again if you watched his recent video on the ideology of Putin's Russia. Why would you mention that you read a big stack of books but you're relying upon a video by Kraut? It's a little weird, isn't it? See, the amount of books he showed, that's like a year of work. That's crazy. That's a lot of reading. That's a lot. I read a lot. Okay. 
all those books, I would not get through that in a year. So when he shows a big stack of books, what I take from that is he bought a big stack of books. Um, and he, he probably, you know, he probably looked at some of them. Uh, he probably found the e-versions on Google Books and searched for the relevant passages to support what he already agreed to ad hoc, or, or already agreed to, uh, uh, in advance, a priori. Um... It's just a little weird. He went over Carl Schmidt, and Carl Schmidt is somebody that I've, that I've also read for my fascist videos. If you read a page every day, you could read them all in the... What? Every minute. Yeah, but it takes more than a minute to read a page carefully. Oh, shit, we got our... Oh, shit, it's Schmidt. Somebody that, I, that I've also read for my fascist videos. The TLDR is Carl Schmidt was... Hang on, let's, let's go back a bit. I want to get the full context for this. Some ideas won't get broadcast very much or will get outright censored. Some will be able to roam freely, and some will get a boost. This image is actually pretty important. I'll have to reference Kraut again. If you watched his recent video on the ideology of Putin's Russia, he went over Carl Schmidt. And Carl Schmidt is somebody that I've, that I've also read from my fascist videos. The TLDR is Carl Schmidt was a lawyer and a judge in Nazi Germany. After the Second World War, he moved to Spain, became a teacher at a university, and continued to write fascist political theory. Carl Schmidt didn't write fascist political theory. Certainly not post the Nazi regime. Um, the concept of the politi or, uh, political theology to and um, the the Leviathan and Thomas Hobbes, those, those veered in that direction. Uh, by and large, the reason why Carl Schmidt has so much uptake right now is precisely because he wasn't fascist. In fact, he, he did not have a great deal of respect for Hitler. Um, he reads books in the way same way Lex Friedman reads books. Um... I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Lex Friedman has never impressed me, but thank you for the $5 Smith Black. Um, oh, let's just see what he has to say here. One of his most important contributions to political science is the idea that what the liberals call neutrality, you know, that free neutral space where people can debate ideas, that that space is not actually neutral. It's simply an extension of liberal hegemony. The reason why is because neutrality is what the liberal values. And so to make a space neutral is to make it liberal. Yes, accurate. Um, it is not an answer. It is not a, a adequate philosophical answer to a challenge to the adequacy of the rules of chess to insist that that debate be sorted out by who can win a chess game. Um, that's, that's accurate. Um, I don't recall Schmidt saying it in that way, but that is a direct implication of his theory. I have to refer back again to that destiny versus an Islamist debate. But when the liberal says, hey, it's okay, you can be a Muslim in this neutral space, that's not acceptable to the Islamist, because that's still an overarching system coming in and imposing neutrality yes. in the same way that he wants to come in and have an overarching system imposing Islamism. Yes. And so there can never be any true neutrality. And the only neutrality that exists is a liberal walled garden that has to be maintained Good. through force. And it's in this way that ideology doesn't actually matter because these are all simply systems of power. No, 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 no. That, that is ideology. That's what ideology is. It's what supplies you with the idea of what is the furniture of your political world, right? So precisely because the liberal assumes that all ideas must be judged through its filter, that is the sign that it is an A. That, that is the sign that the liberal is ideologically saturated. Um, they aren't entertaining liberalism as an idea among others. That is the foundation. That's, that is God. That is nature itself. It is assumed that if something cannot survive the liberal filter, then it is illegitimate. If it can survive the liberal filter, that is, it either doesn't impact or it approves or, or uh, otherwise benefits the liberal system or encourages its its further promulgation, then then it's fine. That's where ideology lies. It's not it's not like the Wikipedia entry of like fascism. Here's your character sheet. These are the things you believe. It has to do with what do you treat as so given it doesn't even factor into your analysis. 
vying and jockeying for more power, with the ideology existing only to post hoc justify the exercise of raw power. And this is ultimately why he believes hearing both sides is dangerous. He doesn't believe in that liberal idea of neutrality. To him, Neither do you unless you're a moron. You just explained why it... What? You just gave a perfectly cogent explanation for why it is not neutral. You claim to have read Carl Schmitt, and Carl Schmitt was a bastard, but he was dead right on that. Um, liberalism is not neutral. That's why historically it's not neutral. It had to be established. And who established it? It wasn't a bunch of peacemongers, it was an imperial power. Everything is just a power game. To get election funding, you need... Short Fat Otaku... You insisted that this man must be American. Why are white Englishmen the primary speakers to American politics? Did we beat the natives in the marketplace of ideas? We need billionaires just like the conservatives do. Rejecting capitalism makes it really hard to get on TV stations owned by capitalists on favorable terms. Harder to advertise yourself, and therefore harder to win. This sounds like some Bernie cope, doesn't it? You know, Trump took a bunch of small donations and then steamrolled through the Republican establishment. Didn't matter that he didn't have the party on his side. He overcame Jeb Bush. The Jeb Bush was less funded than Trump. Corporate candidate through sheer force of personality. And Bernie couldn't do that to the Democrats. Bernie actually lost his 2016 and 2020 primaries. So again, this just sounds like materialist cope from a person who doesn't want to accept that his ideas are not popular. Do you under... Oh my god, he's so stupid. Do you know what Bernie Sanders' net worth is? It's like three million. Do you know what Donald Trump's is? This is before campaign donations. It's like three billion. Yes. Money won, you stupid idiot. Hillary Clinton, by the way, similar scale. Actually, I have the uh, I have the numbers here saved from let's see here quickly. Da 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 da. Stuff for stream. Here we go. Here, let's let's take a gander, shall we? This is the fourth quarter. This is what determined who won the election. Okay. Money raised. Donald Trump. 13 million. Jeb Bush. 7 million. Almost double. What this might be pointing to is that there is a threshold beyond which funding ceases to matter. But that threshold is going to be beyond what Bernie had. So what do Democrats do instead if they can't or are unwilling to criticize the conditions in which ideological debate happens? What do they do since they assume that the conditions are mostly fair for everyone? Trump also never, uh, this is true, Trump also never challenged the establishment. He wanted walls. He wanted a reinforcement of the borders that already existed. Um, he stood for very little else at the end of the day. Like, he, he really did just play into things that were already well established. He was not critical of, of, of public, of, of general inequality. He was not critical of business, da, 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 da. He reaffirmed the system that brought him in. And he was already made extraordinarily wealthy by it in advance. The Republicans found him risky. Because there's no one actively censoring the public debate. This guy thinks that we actually live in a marketplace of ideas, and therefore all of our problems stem from that. But actually, I think a lot of our problems stem from the fact that we don't live in a marketplace of ideas. No. No. The marketplace of ideas is an ideological concoction 
That is when you actually scrutinize it a farce. We don't live in a marketplace of ideas because you can't have a marketplace of ideas at the level of politics because at the level of politics, ideas don't win on merit. It's not a game of educating people. If it was, politics wouldn't be named after a weapon of war. Liberals cling to the idea that even though this process of idealistic debate, whether in privately owned media or in government, was not meant to work for the realization of justice, but to preserve the hierarchical order that benefited its founders, that it is still immoral to work outside of it. Again, this is exactly what I said earlier, just with different words, but the idea is there. This guy is saying that because the institutions have not produced a result that he personally likes, the problem isn't with his lack of popularity. The problem is the system itself. What if the system itself is what determines who is popular and who is not? What if it conditions people from the cradle to the grave to prefer certain locutions and certain modes of critique than others? And what if it does so against their actual interests? Oh, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, isn't it? It's not just that, oh, they were unpopular, therefore invalid. Because maybe the thing that makes things popular is itself conditioned by the inequalities that are being challenged. He thinks the game is flawed because he didn't win it. And the reason he thinks... No, no, he thinks the game is flawed because he can't win it. And crucially, he can't... It's not that he can't win it because he is weak. It's that he can't win it because the rules are slanted in favor of that which reaffirms the rules. Obviously. Um, you don't undermine chess by playing chess. A victory in chess is still playing chess. And so the socialists win with astonishing effectiveness the, the perfect game of chess. They lose not a single piece. They take every single piece in their opponent. A humiliating defeat for the other side. Chess has not been undermined. That is because he believes you can never truly have a neutral game. You can never even approach one. And everything is... No, 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 no. Crucially, the only thing that is neutral is a game. That's the point. When you are insisting on these, these liberal assumptions that everything must be decided by a process and not by a decision, by an accident and not by a plan, you're not engaging in politics. You are playing a game. Simply a power struggle. All of these anti-liberals think fundamentally the same way, which is why you see people switching from far left to far right and back again so easily. They don't actually change their fundamental thinking. They're simply changing what side they play for. Yeah, those are uh, ideological liberals. Um, someone like Haas? Haas from Infrared. I got bad news for you, buddy. You're a liberal cuck. You're, uh, you're, you're not the little tough guy you pretend to be. You are a sellout like Chud Logic. Actually, you're a little worse than Chud Logic. Chud Logic at least has the dignity of being a total cynic. What You have to pretend you're not. What we're left with is a call to hear both sides in a world that will heavily cater to one side. The side that is prepared to dispose of everyone outside an ever-shrinking in-group before admitting that there might be something wrong with our current economic model. And the funny thing is, that describes you as much as it does the fascists. What do you think Eat the Rich means? What do you think Trotsky's famous quote, there is a kernel of fascism inside of every small business owner, means? Well, that's an excellent question. Let's think about this for a few seconds. If, uh, if a system is exploitative, and a particular class of people are doing the exploiting, well, here's the thing, isn't it? They're saying eat the rich, and that sounds nasty, because when you have the ideological presumption that the system that is in place is inherently just and natural, well, I mean, what's wrong with you guys? Why are you just spontaneously wanting to eat the rich? 
what if they want to eat the rich? Or what if they're saying eat the rich rhetorically? Because the rich are actively eating them as they speak. Which is true. And even the fascists actually get this. Just who the rich are, they load a whole bunch of extra baggage onto. And the reason that I, as a liberal, oppose both the far left and the far right is not because I'm some wishy-washy idiot with no sense of morals or no backbone. Or no. It's because you are the far right with no balls. Or no ability to choose a side. It is because I see in you the same totalitarian destructiveness that I see in them. On TV, it meant having a climate change denier pitted against a climate scientist, with the implication that the two sides of the debate were equally worthy of consideration, and that the audience could make up their minds between two mostly evenly matched arguments. Moreover, moreover, uh, this was an argument between someone whose profession was science and someone whose profession was public communication. And it is not the case that having superior knowledge of a subject makes you better at communicating it to a lay audience with none of your background. It may actually be the root, the opposite. Um, there's a reason why populist uh, works of scientific literature are often um, actually fairly inaccurate. Um, it's because they're not on the cutting edge. They are engaging in something that is distant from what the actual scientists are doing in order to communicate a bit of what's going on or what has gone on to a general audience that doesn't have the time to actually become up to date. However, they will still treat this as if this is author an authoritative statement on the, the uh, condition of science presently. And they will argue against people on the basis of what those books say. And they will argue against people who actually do science. Um, people will argue against actual geneticists and psychologists and philosophers of mind, etc., etc., um, on the basis of the contents of the bell curve. When there is a dogmatic commitment to hear both sides, but no analytical model to understand how both sides form, this is what you get. A model of public debate where one side can pay to set the terms of the conversation, and in the process, artificially delay a public decision in their favor. And what has actually happened in that debate? Oil pipelines are extremely unpopular, to the point that projects are getting cancelled despite how much money big oil is throwing at the public debate. Their candidates are still losing elections. People are still turning away from their... Hey, yeah, dipshit, look. Extremely destructive and treaty-violating processes, by the way, I know you don't give a shit about that, um, are being arrested in public debate. Have the encroachments made and the damages done by those oil companies... Have those been remedied? Are those being pushed back? No. No. You're, you're, you're referring to like a temporary uh, slowdown, de-escalation of advance, as if that represents uh, like, like a, a, a counter movement, as if that represents taking back territory. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't at all. It, 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 it represents uh, a, a loss of momentum on the side of the aggressor, but it doesn't represent the victory of the defender. Ideas and their projects largely aren't going forward. This is another direct refutation of the materialist lens. Why are they losing? It's because it's not about the money. It's not about the materialism. It's about ideas actually winning out. Fossil Wait, do we have a marketplace of ideas or not, Short Fat Otaku? You can't just decide that you have a marketplace of ideas determining when I... Like, 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 picking out the good ideas when it suits you, and then saying, no, we don't actually have a marketplace of ideas when it doesn't. This is like... See, this is actually worse than when you have uh, communists saying, no, no, the Soviet Union wasn't real communist. Because first of all, they're right. But secondly, you're doing the exact same thing but insanely stupidly. Um, you're contradicting yourself in this single video. You're insisting, no, there's no marketplace of ideas. That's that's the cause of all our ills. 
but 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 wait a minute. Look, the the oil companies they're slowing down. The marketplace of ideas it's winning. Fuel companies paid for the debate to be between climate change's existence and climate change being a farce, and it won them enough time to shift the debate to where it is today, where climate change is now broadly acknowledged. But now we debate how quickly we really want to adapt. Wait, 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 hold, again, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This sounds like you've won, and all your- No, you fucking idiot. We ran out of time. It got to the point where it couldn't be denied because the resistance of nature was too strong. And where did we arrive at? We have decided you are not orcs. What you're bitching about is how slow it took- is how slow it took you to win. But you still won. Like, oh, oh, check this article out here that he, that he brings up. But now we debate how quickly we really want to- ExxonMobil announces emission reduction plans. Is this not a victory? To adapt. Once again, buying them more time. Here's the actual complaint. We re We respect and support society's ambition to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and continue to advocate for policies that promote cost-effective market-based place solutions. Here's the crucial part that you actually want to pay attention to. ExxonMobil's plans will leverage the continued application of operational efficiencies and ongoing development and deployment of lower emission technologies. You know what that means? We're sticking to what we're already doing. This is spin. You're an idiot. We respect and support society's ambition to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and continue to advocate for policies that promote cost-effective, market-based solutions to address the risk of climate change. Okay. For we did it, Patrick! We saved the city! <laughs> Forget about whether or not net zero is actually a good idea or, or the feasibility of any of this. Just put, put all that stuff aside. What we're talking about is who won the public debate to the point that companies and governments are changing their rhetoric and are implementing new things. Yes, and we will be able to stand proud on the charred black sphere of our planet and go, Hey guys, we won the debate! Huzzah! This guy's complaint is that the left won and change isn't coming fast. The sentence is literally right under here. Continued application. They're not doing anything new. This is the same. There's no plan here. They're not saying, hey, we're going to stop. A, B, C, and D, and we're going to start uh, taking massive hits to our profits to correct these methods, to, 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 to provide alternatives to other oil companies. No. 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 They don't care. The lifespan of the people who are profiting from these companies is shorter than that, of the species, even if it's doomed by what they're doing. They do not care. This is the language that you need to pay attention to, not the highlighted part, we'll continue to advocate. No, no, no. First of all, continue, yes. Continue is, is drawing a line of continuity between what they've been doing before and what they're going to do in the future, which means this is a continuance of the status quo. Just as down here, ExxonMobil's plans will leverage the continued application of operational efficiencies and ongoing development and deployment of lower emission technologies. They're not repealing anything. They are banking on technology just solving all of their problems down the line so they don't need to take a hit. It's enough and that it's coming in the form of a market-based solution instead of, you know, overthrowing capitalism and all the, all the other nonsense. Time. There is no marketplace solution. The marketplace solution is to profit. That's what the market is for. The market does not. Who's buying the salvation of mankind? Nobody's paying for this. This doesn't benefit anybody now living. You don't arrive at disinterested, objective goods through a marketplace dynamic. Marketplace logics rely upon the idea that everybody involved is self-interested and that there is a, a a process of the collision of these interests that results in goods but these interests die with the bearers individuals don't have interests beyond their own lives individual families don't have interests beyond their own lives and we've all internalized that the planet will someday die anyways 
So this means nothing. This is kicking the can farther down the road. And it doesn't matter if it's kicking it over the edge of a cliff, because we won't be there. Time itself is a tool in a bad faith debater's hand. So long as we continue debating on these terms and delay the moment where we commit to a decision, the current state of affairs continues uninterrupted. Yes. What do you mean? They did commit to a decision. They yes. They decided to do the same thing they were doing before. In every single thing, even the part you underlined, they said, we're just continuing. It's not, it, it's not an arrest of a process. It's not a deviation from a process. We're not cutting a project short. We're continuing. Meeting certain benchmarks. Things are changing. You, <laughs> look what's this, this would be, this would be not continuing. Okay, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, we're headed on a collision course hard to starboard. Shut off the oil rigs. Stop, stop the boat. Stop building the pipeline. Stop planning new ones. Da, 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 da. You couldn't do that, by the way, leaving that aside. But that, that would be stopping, right? That would be stopping. They're continuing. And they're continuing because they can't do it. Sorry, because they can't stop. They cannot stop. It's not even up to them. They can't stop. They would die. They'd be outcompeted by other companies. Why? See, now it doesn't become an issue with companies being unethical. Now it becomes an issue with an overarching system that makes it so they have to do these things. And you might think, well, they don't have to do these things. There are people in control of these companies. Clearly, they can make decisions. The people who are selected to be in control of these companies are selected in accordance with a system that makes it so that these companies have to do this to survive. They cannot choose death. They can accidentally die. They cannot choose death happening as a result of the Russian-Ukraine war, where Europe is no longer burning Russian gas. Like, th things are changing. Oh my god. This Europe is burning tons of Russian gas. It just happens to be gas inside the tanks of Russian soldiers. It's got, like, he is correct about bad faith actors and wasting my fucking time. The amount of green initiatives being put forward, the amount of agitation for nuclear energy, the pipelines that are being shut down, like, I, I don't know how you can have the opinions this guy has. Maybe just, maybe he just doesn't look at the real world. Then we know about things like the paradox <laughs> of intolerance. A society oh my fucking god, don't you, don't you fucking dare bring up the paradox of intolerance. Oh Jesus Christ, we already know how the left uses that idea completely incorrectly. They use it to justify just attacking their political opponents, which is fucking retarded because, because Karl Popper's actual views in the topic were that people who simply speak distasteful things, like Nazis, but who don't actually engage in violence, should be left alone. That is what the paradox of intolerance actually says, and these people simply use it to be violent. So if the Nazis didn't beat up the communists in the street, or they didn't beat up Jews, you'd be fine with them taking power, at which point they would be free to use the full power of the state to do exactly that at a scale that was hitherto unimagined. Because this actually happened. We have a record of this now. This is an event that has taken place. This isn't something we are offsetting hypothetically. This is something that goes on all over the place. We emphasize this example because this one was particularly close to home. But this happens everywhere. It happens everywhere. Indeed, even in capitalist liberal states that are run by avowed communists. Violent fucking thugs. It is okay to be committed to tolerance and, in an effort to protect it, therefore to limit the spread of intolerant ideas. Agreed. These fuckers on screen right now look pretty intolerant to me. So, why- What do you mean? Wait, wait, so which is it? He's- I feel like he's just making shit up as he goes. So you're directly contradicting yourself. Agreed, these people look intolerant. Is hearing both sides good, short fat otaku? Or, or are you just, uh... Are you just kind of a sponge? You absorb whatever happens to, to, to land on you at the given moment. Um, this, is, this is what ideology actually looks like. It's not you have a character sheet with a set of weird, funny ideas about how a society should be run. It's you have a bunch of weird, funny ideas about how society should be run written into your brain. They're not things that you adapt. They're things that condition your thinking. Um, in this particular case, he is just reflexively 
uh, going against whatever his interlocutor is saying, because his interlocutor is a critic of liberalism. And the consistency doesn't matter, because the good is identified with the liberal. So even if he falls into um, essentially fascist sympathetic forms of reasoning, or contradicts his own self in the course of a very short video, um, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And you see this kind of logic all over the place. Um, let's take a Christian example. Greg Kukul has an awful, awful book called Tactics, in which he basically uh, gives you, gives uh, very, very nasty sorts of Christian apologists the tools to gaslight opponents into assenting to a something they think is a strategic gain for Christian uh, worldview. Um, that's not loving your neighbor. That's not letting no falsehood fly from your lips. That's not being that's not being virtuous and, and being the best you can be for the sake of the kingdom. That's uh that's using your conceit that you were already right as a license to be wicked to other people. These fuckers on screen right now look pretty intolerant to me. So, while it is important to listen to different perspectives, there is nothing wrong with determining one of them to be more correct or more valid than the other. That's the ultimate goal of reflection and scientific inquiry. Having convictions doesn't make you an extremist. It doesn't make you unreasonable or not pragmatic. It makes you a human being who's willing to stand up for what you believe is right rather than let bad ideas have free reign. Completely agreed. That's why I'm not a leftist. I'm also not a rightist. If you go over all of my various political opinions, you'll probably find a pretty even split of left and right leaning opinions. And you think this saves you. Because you think that your actual identity politically is determined by where you fall on a character sheet. Uh, it's okay, guys. Look, my points balance out. I'm only chaotic good or chaotic evil or whatever or lawful like that's 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 the logic um it's a guy i've got to spread guys like yeah i hate trans people but i'm pro medicare for all that's stupid that's so obviously stupid you should be embarrassed to actually be putting that forward as as a as a as a defense what you are once again is a thoroughly right-wing person uh, with a few accidentally progressive policy preferences um, and you're uh, you have no substance or or, or 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 courage to actually see what you actually are which is you're a comfortable bigot uh, sitting fat and pretty uh, on a system that you didn't fight for that you happen to benefit from by sheer accident That is what being a centrist means. It does not mean being a flip-floppy wishy-washer who doesn't actually have a, have a strong opinion. It means that you hold some left-wing views and you hold some right-wing views. And guess what? In reality... No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is Hitler was a vegetarian logic. Um, here's what you actually are. Uh, you are uh, the human cushion for people like Matt Walsh. And, and that is all. You are the sponge soaking up the sweat from his grisly posterior. That is what you are. You are you are not, in any meaningful sense, a neutral point between these two sides. You are entirely a partisan of the right. You're just a particularly contemptible one. That's probably where the truth actually lies. And in fact, him being a partisan him looking through the world through only a, f a select few chosen leftist lenses that are pre-approved makes him less likely to approach the truth than me. Oh, oh, that was... oh my god. No. No, 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 no. You, you are about as likely to approach the truth as uh, a, a 
dog looking into a mirror. Growling at itself. Do your research, adjust your perspectives based on new evidence, and don't be afraid to pick a side. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. I'll end on an MLK quote from his letter from Birmingham jail, because let's be honest, it's easy points. Oh my god, fuck you. Wait, that's the end of the video? Hold on. We got three minutes to go and that's the end of the video? You know, that minute long ad at the start for that, that stupid podcast, you add that in, like one quarter to one third of this video is just nonsense. All right, well, fuck this guy. Well, no, they're advertising another podcast that'll probably have some interesting ideas and most of his video was actually fairly well thought out and fairly well structured and fairly compelling. He was sloppy in one or two places with his use of technical terminology that rubs me the wrong way in a big way, but um, all told, he was actually quite on point throughout the entire thing. Your video is 25 minutes long. Most of your counters amount to bare assertions of the contrary without any explanation or justification. And when you attempt to give some, you lay bare your total ignorance and idiotic dogmatism with respect to the subject. Anytime I listen to a socialist like this, I, it like reaffirms the idea that socialists and fascists are these blood brothers and they are equally as bad. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a second. It's funny, I was having a similar thought about you. Is, is the name on his... Wait a second, hold on a second. Is the name on his top patrons board? Does it actually say... It says Schmidt. All right. Schmidt has two T's, you fucking idiot. You haven't read the book. You know how you tell when somebody's read a book? They've demonstrated familiarity with the words in it. Oh, shit, did he... Hang on, did he misspell it earlier? able to roam freely, and some will get a boost. This image is actually pretty important. I'll have to reference Kraut again. If you watched his recent video on the ideology of Putin's Russia, he went over Karl Schmidt, and Karl Schmidt is somebody that, that I've also read from my fascist videos. The TLDR is Karl Schmidt was a lawyer and a judge in Nazi Germany. After the Second World War, he moved to Spain, became a teacher at a university, and continued to race is not destiny versus an Islamist debate. Okay, so there's nothing there. Kraut's video. Well, no, 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 Kraut's video was the, the Putin's Russia one. Here, hang on, let me find that quickly. I, oh, I wonder, did Kraut miss... He didn't read Schmidt. He got it entirely from Kraut. He had to have. Let's see. Uh... Route, ideology, Putin's Russia. Okay. That'd be funny if he did. I, I wouldn't expect Kraut to get that wrong, though. That would be odd. Let's see here. Oh my god, no, he did. Look at this. Look at this. So he's got it in segments, right? So up here, he's citing an actual article, so he spells Schmidt correctly. But look at the name of the tag here. Look at this. Right here. The chapter name. Maybe there's uh, names of it in the uh, description here. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> gotcha. Carl Schmidt. It's with a D. Sh that's that's a, a way you can pronounce, or a way you can spell Schmidt. But not this Schmidt, it's a different name. Um, there's a Brian Schmidt who wrote a very good book um, called the... Uh, Political Discourse of Anarchy, which is on the history and the evolution of international relations theory and the ideological underpinnings of it. That's very worth reading. Um, Carl Schmidt. TT. DT. We got him, boys. Oh, what a boob. <laughs> Carl 
Carl Schmidt with a D is a architect that lived between 1836 and 1888. Haha. <laughs> oh, God, what a, what an absolute clown. No, it's a patron with the last name Schmidt, you idiot. He's not... not... Is, is the name on his... Wait a second, hold on a second. Is the name on his top patrons board? Does it actually say... That says Schmidt. All right, all right. I think I've, I think I've gone too down too many rabbit holes for today. I'm getting out of here. And I am too. I suppose some final words are in order. So, uh... Short Fat Otaku. This was a very bad, ignorant, and embarrassing video that you should be deeply ashamed of. Um, if I had made it, I would close down my entire channel. And I would never show my face in public again. Um, when you say you've read Schmidt, I don't fucking believe you. Um, you don't demonstrate the level of competence I would expect someone who's actually been educated by Schmidt's writing to demonstrate. Uh, I don't believe you've read any of the other stuff you've read, because Hannah Arendt is far from as, as, as crude and incoherent as you are. Presumptuous and prone to narrativizing as she is. Um, you transparently went to a used bookstore, bought a pile of books, or maybe you can just afford to buy them all new on Amazon or something, it's something you did, and you took a picture of them. And maybe you, you look through one or two, but you're, you're too lazy. You're too lazy. Knowing things takes discipline. You are not a disciplined man. Um, you, 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 you use them to slap together stuff with as much abandon as what Ifaltis does. You just, you just pick and chose things that conform to what you already believed, what you already wanted to argue. You have nothing but contempt for your audience and for the people you're addressing. Um, and, and that's it. You're a clown. This is, this is scandalously incompetent. Um, and you're a scumbag as well, so go fuck yourself. Thanks everybody for watching. Take care. Have a good night.